In November 2009, I went to my very first copywriting industry event. It was AWAI's bootcamp and job fair. And I felt a little bit out of place, like arriving at the Delray Beach Marriott and getting all checked in. But in the line to check in for the conference for the three and a half days or whatever that we're going to be there, I saw this guy about my age, Henry Bingaman. And we just connected. It was his first copywriting event. It was my first copywriting event. And we we just connected there. And um, little did we know that from that day forward, both of us would go on to have fairly high trajectories into the financial copywriting world. He became one of the top copywriters at Money Map Press, one of the, the biggest, most successful financial publishing uh, imprints out there. And uh, so we decided to reconnect. He has this new Getting Out of the Machine podcast. And we decided to just kind of interview each other, have a conversation about starting with where we met and uh, and, and our dual career trajectories and where they've overlapped and where they've been a little bit different and share what about whatever value we could with uh, both his listeners for his Getting Out of the Machine podcast and my listeners for Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. And so that's what you're getting in today's episode. It's this conversation between two old friends in the copywriting industry, and hopefully you will get a ton of value here. These are the proven direct response marketing, copywriting, and entrepreneurship success strategies you can use today to write your own ticket and create the life you want. I am Roy Furr, and this is Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Now, here's today's breakthrough. Okay, here we are. It's a joint episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets and Getting Out of the Machine. I'm here with Henry Bingaman. Henry Bingaman is here with me, Roy. And Henry, let's let's start our conversation where we met. So in the hallway at the Delray Beach Marriott, standing in front of the registration table, at AWAI, let's see, November 2009. So what do you what do you remember about that moment, I suppose? So I had never been to, you know, I was about a year into my copywriting at that point, and I had never been to any kind of conference, anything like that before. So I remember walking in and seeing a bunch of people who were way older than I thought they were going to be. <laughs> like, remember at the time, it was most of who they were attracting were people in their 50s, 60s, sometimes 70s. So yeah, I walk into that building and I had been staying in another hotel because I couldn't afford the Marriott. So I was staying in a hotel way down the road. I had driven down from Pennsylvania. So I was exhausted and I walk in and I'm just intimidated. I'm like, who, who are these older people? Oh, they must be super experienced. And then I'm going up to the registration line and I see this other dude that's clearly in his twenties. And I'm like, oh, thank God, (laughs) there's somebody, (laughs) somebody of my generation here. And so I immediately just... I forget if you introduced yourself to me or I introduced myself to you, but like that first meeting where we were like, all right, we're going to be friends now. <laughs> we're doing yeah, this yeah. conference together. No, it, and it was, it was kind of crazy considering both of our career tra- trajectories that we were just like, you know, two mid late twenties. I don't know when you were born. I'm 82. So yeah, I was 85. Um, I was 24 85. at the time. Okay. Um, so both of us in our, in our mid twenties and, um, and, for me, it was my first AWAI too. So I wasn't, I wasn't like super comfortable there. Uh, it was my first conference that I'd paid for. Like I'd been to other mar- marketing conferences because I was already in marketing at the time, but it was, it was a weird experience. <laughs> I suppose it was good to have uh, somebody who was in, in roughly the same boat as I was to, uh, you know, to, to dive into this big unknown with, um, so for both of us, there was there was kind of some pivotal moments there in terms of becoming a, a freelancer. For me, I specifically remember because I wrote the sales letter for the next year's <laughs> boot camp. Uh, three months and three days afterwards, uh, from getting home from that, I walked out of my full time job for the last time. And so, you know, if your podcast is called "Getting Out of the Machine." Uh, to some degree for me, like I, I still call that my personal independence day. Uh, how close in timeline were you? Cause I know that we, we paralleled a lot, especially early on. Yeah. I had been a full-time freelancer for about six months at the, the point okay. when I, I went to that conference and I had a couple clients. I had actually, I think I was wrong because I did go to the wealthy web writer conference in Austin. Okay. That was the one that was, the, that was the conference where I ended up leaving that and quitting my job uh, shortly okay. after. Um, and yeah. I had I had gotten AWAI as a client. They had uh, agreed to hire me to write a couple little articles and uh, try out a Facebook marketing campaign. 
Um, okay. But I, it, it was a distinctly different crowd at the web writer than the main conference that they have. Uh, yeah, I would imagine like, like their main conference at, at that time, probably most of the clients had been acquired through retire this year. And just that word retire, there's not a lot of, you know, 20 some year olds who yeah. are like retire that re retire. The, okay. Um, or like retire just doesn't register. It's not in our um, reticular activating system to pay attention to. That oh word, yeah. Right? Well, we're thinking about building our careers. You're in your mid twenties. You're, you're not yeah. thinking about retirement at all. Um, yeah. Um, so that's fascinating. So both of us, uh, a interesting parallel that's not true of a lot of people who go through AWAI. Um, there, there are two parallels that I want to pull out. One is that both of us had AWAI as a client, <laughs> even by that time, right? Both of us, yeah. you know, our first boot camp, and both of us had AWAI as a client because we were pursuing the opportunities that they gave us on the side, right? But another parallel that I know that stuck out really early is a lot of people come to AWAI as um, like business opportunity buyers finding copywriting through AWAI. And both you and I were copywriters who found AWAI as a source inside copywriting. Well, that's, so that's not exactly true. So, oh, okay. The way maybe, I started my career. Yeah. So I graduated from uh, University of Pittsburgh with a degree in fiction writing, which, you know, there's not a lot of uh, companies lining up to hire you with your newly minted degree in fiction writing. So yeah. I took, I, I was just, my, I remember my senior year was like a week before I graduated and I was just scrolling through monster.com looking for jobs. And uh, so United Airlines was hiring for flight attendants. Um, I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I didn't actually, I'd never thought about being a flight attendant before, but they were going to fly me to Chicago for the interview. And I'd never been to Chicago. So I was like, yeah, all right, I'll take, okay. yeah. I'll take a free flight out for the interview. Um, and I remember I got there and I was sitting in the lobby and it was about 80% uh, fairly young and attractive women that were applying for the job. And then the other 20% that were guys were more interested in flirting with me than they were with the uh, ladies in the room. So I was thinking, all right, if I get this job, they put us in a, uh, it's a training camp for five weeks outside of Chicago in an isolated facility. And I'm like, there's going to be all these young single ladies and a couple of, of gay dudes so I'm going to be like the only romantic option for half of these women. And I was young, you know, I was 22 years old, 21 years old, single. And I was like, this will be great. <laughs> but so I ended up getting one track job. mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I actually did get a girlfriend in that uh, training camp. So, um, but yeah, I graduated. I mean, I got out of that training camp, started being a flight attendant for $20,000 a year, living just outside DC with yeah. three roommates. It was just not the ideal situation. Yeah. Um, and so my dad had a supplement company when I was growing up and he had bought the AWA course to uh, oh, try to sell more supplements. I remember so, this. Yes. So he's, he's looking at me. He had tried to give it to me a couple of times during college. And I was like, I'm not into this commercialized stuff. Don't mess with my art of writing. Uh, yeah. And then you start making, you know, a thousand dollars, $2,000 a month or a little under that. And you're like, well, you know, I can write, maybe I should try this thing out. So yes. he gave me the course and that, uh, so they actually did introduce me to the concept of copywriting through my dad who had okay. bought the product. But I think even by that first boot camp, maybe I'm wrong, but I think even by that first boot camp, you were like deep into you didn't stop at AWAI. Like when I yeah, no, when I, I had when I, I had gotten a couple other clients just here and there and so okay. from my dad's connections in the health space. So some okay. other supplement manufacturers and uh chiropractor and natural health people, I'd gotten a couple little sales letters that I just tried to rip off John Carlton and they bombed terribly. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I I have a specific rip off John Carlton and it bombs uh, <laughs> history too. All right. Um so so like my backstory, I I kind of have that same. I think that a lot of people who become good copywriters because you you have to on some level be excited about the writing part because that's so much of the the time that we spend. Um to be successful at this part of my background was thinking, yeah, I'm a writer too, like you. Right. Um, my minor was in writing. My major was, or my minor was in English, like kind of generic English minor. Um, my major was a bachelor of arts in psychology, which is about as marketable as a, uh, fiction writing degree. Right. Uh, you have to, you have to get a master's or PhD if you want much work in psychology. 
Um, so I got the I got the best job that I could get at the time when I graduated, uh, which was answering the angry customer service phone calls at the local gas company. So <laughs> let's take some psychology just to, so, to manage yeah. your own brain. <laughs> so so uh, if you didn't pay your bill all winter and you needed somebody to call and yell at because your service got shut off on the first warm day of spring, you know, hi, this is Roy with Aquila. Um, <laughs> and um, but but the cool thing was like, I ended up working noon to 9 p.m. No choice of shifts. That's just where they stuck. It was just like, you know, no choice for you, I'm sure, of flight routes and whatever. No. Yeah. Um, but like after 7 p.m., nobody wants to talk to the gas company. And I found this book called The Well-Fed Writer, which, you know, if you're a writer and you're like, okay, well-fed plus writer, awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not the starving artist. And I like fell down the rabbit hole of, you know, he was actually disparaging. Like I give that book a lot of credit for introducing me to copywriting, but he was like, I'm a freelance commercial writer and I write, uh, I write annual reports for publicly traded companies. Do you remember who wrote it? Yeah. Peter Bowerman. Peter Bauer. I know that name. Yeah. That's probably because I mean, of the book. Yeah. Uh, he, he did well-fed writer, well-fed writer part two, well-fed self-publisher. Like, and for me, like, it was a good, it was a good intro to the field, but he was disparaging these people who are like, they write sales letters and uh, they, they get paid based on the royalty or based on the sales generated. And he's like, I could never do that. And I'm like, that's interesting. Like, oh yeah. Okay. I um, mean, I'd done commission sales stuff, but it'd been like selling newspaper subscriptions. So, and I wasn't very good at it. Um, but something excited me about this, like entrepreneurial direct response. So I got the bug that way. But I, for me, like I saw it as my ticket to, to freedom that I wanted as much as anything. Cause he was talking about being this freelance commercial writer and having control of his schedule and having control of his time. And, um, at the time I was kind of like, I was in a giant call center with like probably 60 plus reps in the call center and it was unionized and there was no way to get paid more based on my performance. And I was similarly making about $20,000 a year and having people yell at me and no control over my schedule and any of that. And I had decided like years before, you know, just nod to getting out of the machine I remember specifically going in, my mom was a computer programmer and did well as a computer programmer, but I remember going into her office on a weekend when she had a project that she was working on. And it's just this giant, it was like the epitome of the nineties workplace, right? It's this giant room with the fabric wall cubicles up like, you know, five and a half feet tall and uh, just the hum of computers and it's floor after floor of this. Right. And, and to me, that was the mission. I, I call it a cubicle farm. I'm not original terminology, right? Corporate beehive is how I always picture it. <laughs> That's what it is. Like, you know, and you're just a worker bee. And I had no clue what I wanted to do, but I knew that I didn't want to do that. And so it wasn't until I found copywriting, which to me is still like the most liberating single person career option that you can choose, right? Because it doesn't feel like one of those careers. Uh, but it was, it was, it was, it wasn't until I found copywriting that I went from, I know what I don't want to do to, I know what I do want to do. Did you have any, like, so a lot of my friends at the time, you know, they got degrees in computer science and, you know, business and a couple of them went to law school, a couple of them went to medical school. And so they were looking at me, you know, as like, what are you doing in the scammy industry? Like, what yeah. is this? You're writing junk mail. And like, did you feel yeah. any of that social pressure of like the awkwardness of being in an industry that nobody else understood? Because I think a lot of people, they get into, they'll start doing copywriting and they'll yeah. see the potential of it. But then their peer group will be like, yeah, you can't do that. Because peer groups tend to try to bring you back to the median, right? Yes, very much so. So... <sighs> I, I took a little bit of a different route, uh, kind of like almost influenced by Mark Ford, Michael Masterson, like the chicken entrepreneur idea, right? So I knew that I wanted to do copywriting, but my timeline was, this was 2005. So four years before I met you, right? Um, 2005, 
Uh, it was spring 2005 when I bought the Wellfed Writer. And I think I ended up getting the Copywriter's Handbook at about the same time and like really early stuff on copywriting, right? I knew I was getting married July 9th, 2005. And I knew that my wife was going to grad school basically three weeks. We were going on a week and a half honeymoon. And a week and a half after that, we were moving to Oregon, right? And she was going to be getting a stipend as part of her PhD program. But like, she wasn't going to be earning much money, right? right? Like she was getting her PhD, not getting rich. Um, and so I knew we were moving across the country. We were going to have like a half income. So I knew that I needed a full-time income. And, and a portable so, one at that. Yeah, yeah, fairly portable. Uh, but, but I was like too afraid to start freelancing at the time. Um, and so I started applying for marketing jobs. And I just knew, like, I wrote a cover letter that said, I know my resume sucks for a marketing job. I know that nothing about this resume is good for a marketing job, but I know that this is what I want to do. I know that this is what I'm going to do. And if I make you successful, it's going to allow me to be successful in this. And so I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to work harder than anybody with more qualifications to make you successful. And I got a few job interviews based on, by the way, cover letters, if you are applying for anything, cover letters are super underrated. Like most people who I've ever tried to hire, they don't even try with their cover letter. Um, and they completely suck <laughs> and you yeah. don't hire them. Um, but cover letters can get you the job when your resume won't, um, at least get you the interview. So I so got a think, bunch of interviews. You think um, that was your first big piece of successful copywriting? <laughs> it was. And like the person who hired me told me that multiple times. <laughs> like he said, I would not have hired you if it weren't for your cover letter. Um, he still reads, he still like watches my episodes and really? reads cool. my emails and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I actually ended up with a full-time marketing job and it was just like, I wanted to be a copywriter and they gave me opportunities to be a copywriter, but then I was working inside the marketing department and it was like a $2 million a year IT training publisher. And then in the next three and a half years, we grew it to like, I think it was about 8 million when I left. Um, and it was on a really good growth trajectory beforehand, but um, certainly a lot of this is stuff that happened. Like I can, I measured it, but I got, I got involved with like database marketing and, and copywriting and helping run a marketing team and hiring marketers. And I got involved with the sales team and like all that stuff um, because I was too afraid to like go out and become a freelancer. Right. So I accepted less freedom so that I could get more freedom later. Um, and then, and then went to AWAI and a couple months later, like they knew that I was on my way out again, because I had a deadline. I had a deadline that my wife was finishing her PhD program and we were going to move across the country again. And I was going to lose that job. So it was like, I better figure this out. Um, yeah. So what was the trigger point? The actual, like, I know I can drop the job and go freelance now. Like what was the project you got or the moment you realized I can do this? Um, okay. So all along the way, like I had been clear, my destination is freelance copywriting. Um, and I'd even gotten some clients on the side. Like I got David Bullock and I got Kim McCarthy and um, a lot of clients that wouldn't be recognized. But then I was working with AWAI while I was working that full-time job. But then when I went to AWAI and I came home, I was just like, I have to set a date, right? Um, and it was when I got really intentional about actively prospecting and suddenly my calendar started filling up. Like my plan was February 28th was going to be my last day at my job. And um, I think it was around Christmas time that I was just like, I'm going to start booking people for February 28th forward. And my offer is going to be the projects like the old AWAI project where you do the, the spec challenge was sales letter, order form and like three emails and three space ads or something like that, right? And I said, that's gonna be my template. And I'm just gonna to go to all these people and start trying to get projects from them. And then suddenly when I said, February 28th, I'm gonna start doing this. And I had that very specific offer that I was making, 
because I was reaching out to people who were already doing marketing that way. Like, and I talk about this with people all the time. Like if you offer them what they're already hiring other people for as a freelancer, it's pretty likely that they're going to try you. Like if, if you can convey some level of confidence. So I, I put that out and then it was just like, I had so much demand that I had to quit early. And so it was, it was going to be like, I think February 15th or whatever the Monday was, was going to be a day off work anyway. Um, and so like Thursday, I just decided I'm going to take a long weekend and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, whatever. And then on Tuesday, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start my freelance stuff. So February 11th, it's like, bye. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and, and if it weren't for like sushi and an entrepreneurial, like, uh, kind of Silicon Valley environment, like free sushi, poker nights, all of that stuff, that job would not have kept me as long as it did. Yeah. But that, that moment was like, as soon as I just took control over the client getting process. Um, so it, 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 I, I think going to AWA and seeing people probably at that point, I was looking up to you because you actually been doing full-time freelance, like as we talk back through it, um, whether or not, you know, I should have or whatever versus other people I could have looked up to, um, to see other people who were doing it, I think may have been the biggest pivot point. Um, yeah, I think I had a little bit of different strategy for getting clients early on is okay. I, I would get, so with like AWAI, I would propose things that they weren't doing, but should be. Yeah. Like according to their own experts, like the Facebook ads, this, you know, 2009, Facebook ads did not work. There just yeah. wasn't this, the system there in place, but you know, they had had, I forget it was, who was it? Andrew Palmer, I think had done a thing on Google ads. And I was like, oh, well I could take yeah. what I learned here and try a Facebook ad campaign for you. And yeah. so they, they paid me for that. And then I would, uh, they had the wealthy web writer launching around that time. And I was like, oh, you need some video content. Why don't I do these two minute guru videos, which I, so I did the first batch of those for a year and they're paying me, I think 400 bucks each for those. So I, and with uh, the chiropractic and natural health clients, I was like, oh, you're, you're not doing any email list. Let me do a lead gen thing and uh, then write some emails for you. So I was, yeah. I was just showing them the value. I'd already gotten in through some way or another. And then I would show them value and try to pitch them on that. Yeah. I find that that's hard like it's clear you were having some success and probably some of that comes from just conviction or courage or whatever. Oh, to... I was, I was making it look like I was having success, but those projects weren't coming in as regularly as they needed to. I was running up credit cards at the time. It was not, okay. it was not yeah. really good. I didn't get my first really good project until the 2010 boot camp. Uh, okay. I went back down. I was so deep in debt. Like I remember I had to call my mom on the way back and borrow money to fill up my gas tank because okay. I just, I was like that out of money. But I had gotten a retainer for fifty seven hundred dollars a month at that at that uh, boot camp to work with Natural Health Dossier and Mark Ford directly. I so remember, yeah, yeah, that period just, of time. I put in so many hours, and like it was it was dumb the way I did it. I think yours is a much smarter way to do it. <laughs> but you know, I was a cocky young kid, and I was like, I'm going to make this work. And then yeah. I was too embarrassed to go back on myself. <laughs> well, so I, yeah, I think the differentiation for me is I I, I, I guess. Part of it, like there is a part of me that can't not be responsible. And that can be a big disadvantage as an entrepreneur. Um, I do find that people who are willing to like just put it all on the line, like there is something to be said for that for entrepreneurship. But but for me, like even by 2009, my son was born in May 2009. And so add to the 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 challenges that I had to overcome in launching my freelance career, I had a son that was under one. Um my wife's income was not going to improve for at least another year because she had to go to internship. Um, I had a mortgage that we were paying. So I was primarily responsible for that. And so we had set aside, we had set aside like three months income, but my goal, like three months worth of bills. Um, so that if it was a little bit of a slow start, but, but I had this like, you know, gun to the head back against the wall, whatever uh, mentality of, uh, if I don't make this work and do the work to make it work, great. I wasn't getting paid per project anywhere near what I've gotten paid recently. Um, so it was a lot of work, but it was like, if I, if I don't make it work, um, 
you know, my whole family struggles because of it. Um, so I didn't even have that option to not make it work, <laughs> you know, like, um, there's something about know. not, not having options that makes you yeah, I mean, figure it out. No, I, I have had dumb periods. Like I don't, I don't, I think that anybody that's successful, I remember talking to Marcella about this, Marcella Allison. Um, and like, I don't know, uh, 2012, 13, something, there was a period where I was just like over committing to individual projects, but not, but getting paid on a project basis. Yeah. And so I'd spend way too much time on a project that was not um, paying bills equivalent to the time I was spending on it. And um, so I went through a big slump around there where, uh, you know, things financially were not looking as good. So it's it's not like I've sailed through perfectly and I've certainly made mistakes. Um, I tend yeah, to like, see any freelancer's income goes up and then they'll have a couple, a year or two of their down and then it goes way up. Like there's, yeah. there's this wave effect in the upward direction, but there's always pullbacks. Yeah. I, I remember, um, um, who was it? Somebody talked about the Kubler Ross change curve at AWI one time. Are, are you familiar with that? Cause it's exactly the curve that you're describing. It's like, um, and, and it, it, it applies like when you're making changes, like psychologically, uh, emotionally, mentally, but it also applies. It's like your emotional response to a project. It is your oh, is uh, emotional response to your career. Initial excitement, like Valley of despair. That's yeah. the one. Okay. That's the one. And, and, you know, some of that might actually, there may be some like emotional correlation to that income that you're describing. Cause when you start off freelancing, you're like, I'm, I'm going for it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, you know, everything's going to be awesome. And you have that energy that you bring. And then things get hard because you realize that it's not just easy and automatic, like the uh, promise in the sales letter that you read that got you into copywriting, right? Um, and then you're emotionally down and that translates to not as good of copy. And then you later you figure out like, this is going to take some work. This is going to like, as much as it's about getting out of the machine and having freedom, like you're kind of building your own machine to support you. Um no matter what that ends up looking like, um, you know, whether that's going completely off grid and figuring out how to provide crops for yourself and, you know, grow, grow food on your farm and whatever, there's a machine that you're building there to support yourself or your freelance career or whatever. And then eventually you figure that out and it becomes a time of plenty. Yeah. You know, when I say getting out of the machine, usually what I'm referring to is the system of education, corporations, government, you know, the health system, it's all pushing you in one direction. So it, it, it yeah. is about building your own machine. It's about not being caught ground up in that machine. And, and kind yes. of, it's, it's not like, you don't have to fight the government to find freedom in your own life. You just have to build your own thing. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. could we, we talk about some of the pivotal moments in your career? Like what was the first time you felt financially comfortable as a freelancer? Do you remember that? Uh, I think it was the, probably, um, let's see. So it would have been after I transitioned to working with the financial publishers. I, I did a spec assignment that got me in the door at Casey research. And at the time they weren't owned by Agora yet. It was owned by Doug. You were the copy chief over there for a bit, weren't you? For a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, so. Like I got one project with them and then they gave me a three project contract and then they gave me a retainer, which I held on to for about 18 months that included writing and uh, being, I always call it like an interim copy chief because I was never like fully promoted into that role. And I didn't necessarily try to be promoted into that role, but it was kind of the role that I was filling. Um, if that makes sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it was my third project for them. So it was the second one in the group of, of three before I got a retainer uh, was my first million dollar promo. And it was, um, maybe I'd actually written one for AWAI before that, but the, the million dollars took a while to, to 
uh, to yeah. play out, right? And just to clarify, a million dollar promo, usually when copywriters talk about it, is a promo that does a million dollars in sales, not pays you personally a million dollars. Yes, yes. Um, and that's what I'm saying, um, what I'm saying here. So uh, it was it was for like a, it was for a backend service uh, in the gold market. And this was early, early 2011, which for those who followed the precious metals market was like peak time to be selling just like, just like late, uh, 2021 was peak time to be selling crypto. And I am pretty sure that it's going to go through a winter similar to what the precious metals has gone through for the last 10 years, that, uh, crypto is not going to be a beloved asset for a while. Uh, we'll you see. know, other people will hate me. You may hate me for that statement. Oh, I, don't, I don't hate you. It, it'll it'll do what's going to do. But I yeah. did I did buy the largest chunk of my crypto right by the peak, like within like four days of the peak. So that's most people's story. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, when it when it comes to market peaks, um, uh, the so so timing wise, like I was launching this backend service for or relaunching, they were opening up access and it was like limited maximum a thousand spots. It was at the time, this was before you could do a lot of um, like private placement marketing. Mm -hmm. So we had to be super careful, but the way that this guy ran was he would go visit these, these gold mines and then he would make recommendations and he, they were careful that pretty much every recommendation had to have a public stock recommendation, but it was, if you're an accredited investor, here's the number to call if you want to participate in the private placement on these terms. Um, so it wasn't a accredited investor service, um, but it was like, you know, so it was this very like high end aimed at investors who were interested in investing a lot of money in unique opportunities. And he'd just done like 350% in, um, I want to say like two years or something. So like every, everything lined up for this yeah. promo to be awesome. And it was, and it was the biggest promo that they had done in short of their lifetime promotions, which are much higher ticket products um, in, in a very long time. And, and people uh, forget at that point in time, it was very much a recession mindset around the country for uh -huh. investors. You know, we had just been coming out of 2008, 2009. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it was people yeah, did not, 2011. yeah, people were not recognizing that the, this upward trajectory was anything more than a slight recovery. Like they didn't yeah. recognize what the next 10 years were going to look like. No, so. not at all. Um, so I did this and, and Casey was a fairly small publisher at that point. And most of the revenue honestly came from Stansbury copywriters writing promos to the Stansbury list to sell Casey products. And that's why Stansbury ended up buying them. <laughs> um, but, but I wrote this promotion for them and then I... Over, and, and it was only open for like two, three weeks and I was getting paid monthly royalties. So, and the two to three weeks were split across two months, but I got paid three and a half percent, which is three and a half percent of a million. And it was pretty close to a million. Um, three and a half percent of a million is $35,000. And yeah. so I got two checks back to back that added up to 35,000 on top of my normal monthly income, which was more than enough to pay the bills. And I was like, all right, cool we're onto something here, right? Like, um, just remember, so do you remember the feeling of like, just the tension melting out of your body when you get those checks? It's not even yeah. a celebratory feeling, or at least my first big royalty check it wasn't celebratory. It was just relief. It's like, Oh, all right. This worked. Yeah. You know, there's this, this interesting, like, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent. Um, the whole law of attraction thing and like imagining the feeling of the wish fulfilled. I once heard somebody talk about, um, like the important thing to do when you imagine the wish fulfilled is not just to imagine the positive feeling, but to imagine the relief of tension of the wish being not fulfilled. Like, oh, finally it paid off, right? Like, um, and yeah, I absolutely know what you're talking about. And um, whatever you think about law of attraction stuff, but uh, the, the, I remember it it is a very, very visceral feeling of like, you can finally take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember like one of my favorites is getting a phone call from the business banker at the local bank. And they're like, we noticed you deposited 
this big check. Is there anything that we can do for you, Mr. Fur? <laughs> like, how do you make money? Again? Like, tell me about your, oh, you write junk mail? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've had to explain to bankers what I try to do. And they're just, they yeah. never get it. Well, I stole from Richard Armstrong the whole, like, I write junk mail as a joke. If somebody's not in, in the industry, I just tell them I write junk mail. And then it's a joke. And then you can actually kind of talk about it because there's this point of reference. And I'm like, yeah. well, I don't, I don't write the junk mail that you receive probably, but that's the kind of stuff that we do. <laughs> And it, it fins it off, right? Self-deprecating humor is, is, is great for fending off any kind of negativity around that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have different answers of, about what I do, depending on who's asking. Like if, if I want to seem important, I'm like, oh, I run an internet advertising agency. Yeah. Because, you know, that's what my Ascension marketing services is, basically is, even though I just yeah. contract with basically two clients for yeah. the last couple of years. And well, and now, and now you're like, I'm a, I'm a, accredited investor in private companies. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. I say I'm in the weed business now. <laughs> two, oh, yeah, of my, two of my biggest investments are in cannabis. Yeah. You know how Snoop Dogg is in the weed business? I'm in the weed business too. So basically yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Snoop Dogg or Martha Stewart. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. So I, I just because I, I'm invested alongside uh, Raekwon for Wu-Tang. So mm. we were out, we were out touring one of these uh, grow facilities in Oklahoma city. It was like yeah. two a year and a half ago or so. And uh, we're hanging out in Airbnb with me, Jed Canty and Raekwon and the, <laughs> our lawyer, Josh. And I, I for some reason, Little Dicky came up. Do you know who Little Dicky is? He's like a goofy rapper. Yeah, 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 I do. He did a song with Snoop Dogg. And I remember that's how I know of him. Raekwon yeah. had never heard of Little Dicky. And I was like, oh, you got to yeah. see this. And I put on the video with, with Snoop Dogg. And he's like, hold on, I got to text Snoop. It's just... <laughs> the craziest thing where you're like, oh yeah, you know that dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. It's a weird life. Uh, it is. Yeah. But, but back to marketing. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is because, so you did this, the, the sales letter for the Titans of Direct Response uh, with Brian Kurtz back. Yeah. How many years ago is that now? I just was emailing Brian. Um, it's, it's about eight years ago, but I emailed him and I said, by the way, like 10 year anniversary is coming up. Are you planning on doing anything for Titans, like Titans X or something? Right. And he might actually, as what he said to me is, is, you know, you've got, you got the gears turning. Um, so it was, it was eight years ago. So at this point it feels like uh, rehashing old news, but yeah, I learned from Dan Kennedy that you, you, you make every molehill you have into a mountain, but that's, that's actually what I wanted. Molehill. Yeah. That's the one I wanted to talk because you sold out that event and it was a, it's a big feather in your cap to get, and you got direct feedback from Gary Bensavinga. I think you got a Gary Bensavinga testimonial. But yes, you have since then leveraged that <laughs> into so many different opportunities. So yeah. can you, you kind of talk about how you ended up getting that project in the first place and then what the ways you kind of worked with it even after it was successful? Yeah. So you're, you're familiar with the Dream 100 strategy from Chet Holmes, right? Like, you I, know, I am not. Oh, man. One of the best books on selling is the ultimate sales machine. Um, and it's written by Chet Holmes, who's passed away, but he worked with uh, Jay Abraham on developing programs around that and stuff. Um, and in that book, he talks about the dream 100 strategy and all sorts of people, including me and Russell Brunson have repeated this a whole bunch, giving credit to Chet Holmes. It's also like David Ogilvy talks about this with a different name um, in Confessions of an Advertising Man. Um, Basically, the Dream 100 strategy is you come up with a list of your top ideal clients that you want to work with. So I remember, uh, well, I'm sure I still have the spreadsheet somewhere. I, I wrote non-Agora financial publishers was like .xls, right? Um, it was an Excel spreadsheet. And the reason that it was non-Agora is because when we were coming up in financial for the most part, Agora required you to go work in-house in Baltimore or Delray Beach. And I did not want to go. I didn't want to move to Baltimore or Delray Beach. Um, it was just not in my life plan. And so it was not Agora Financial Publishers. And I came up with this, this list. And then once I had the big list, I narrowed it down based on who I could find using long form sales copy, right? Going back to me saying, I'm looking for marketers who are doing a long, long copy sales letter, order form, et cetera, right? And I came up with a shorter list. And 
boardroom slash bottom line was on that list as one of the big, you know, they, they're less like investment publishers, but they were still kind of. There's some financial publishers. advice in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I knew that they hired a lot of the best copywriters. So kept them on the list. And I knew Brian was at boardroom. Right. And so I had connected with him off and on a bunch of times. Like he was going to AWAI and speaking at AWAI. Um, I interviewed him for my, like Jed used to call it live with Roy podcast <laughs> versus live with Roy. Uh, <laughs> I gave him just like, just like positive vibes whenever I could like message him things. At one point I got a piece of boardroom direct mail and um, I, I sent him a note and I said, Hey Brian, like this looks like really good direct mail. I noticed that you're not using the back of the envelope and your the front of the envelope is covered with great bullets. I notice you're not using the back of the envelope. And so I wrote a list of bullets and I said, you know, if you want to test these, if you want to use them, whatever, just do it. And he forwarded it on to, I think, Michelle Wolk or somebody on the uh, creative team at the time. And so I was just doing everything I could to provide him value. And then he hosted an event with Perry Marshall, who was another one of my marketing heroes, who at this point, like, (laughs) it's funny, uh, kind of a small world thing. Perry has come to my improv show in Lincoln, Nebraska, (laughs) because his brother is in my improv group uh, because his family is from Lincoln, Nebraska. Really? That's awesome. Um, So I have a... Perry, I have and Perry's in Chicago, right? So that's a yeah, hike Perry's, for him. Yeah. I mean, he was going to be in Lincoln anyway, so he didn't come for me, certainly, but he came for the family. Um, but we've also like gone to coffee in Lincoln when he's in town and stuff. But I hadn't met Perry yet. So Brian was hosting Perry the year before Titans at Boardroom. And so I paid to go as an attendee. And I wrote this huge testimonial for Perry, which then Brian used to promote the event. Uh, I remember calling him like one of the top five copywriters who's not actually selling copywriting services right now or something, because I really like his copywriting. Um, And then Perry used it to promote the event and like all this stuff, right? And so it was all about getting in the good graces of these people, developing this relationship because they were on my Dream 100 list. And Brian had sent out an email to his list about, oh, I'm thinking of doing something big next year as the fall on for Perry. And we talked and then like, I randomly emailed him the day after Marty Edelston passed away. And we ended up, I remember sitting, I remember which coffee shop I was sitting in the parking lot and talked to him for like an hour. I was like, if you don't want to talk today, like, I understand, dude, like, he's like, no, I want to talk and Marty would want me to talk. And so we talked about what Titans would become before it was really a plan. Right. And then it was just a matter of like, Brian wrote the sales letter, David Deutsch, he sent it to David Deutsch. It was like eight pages. And David's like, Brian talked about this on stage. David said something like, Hey, uh, so if I wanted an expert on databases and lists, you know, I would come to you. Um, Why don't you, you know, find someone to write this and enjoy the rest of Sunday with your family. And I got an email from Brian because of, years of like developing that relationship, right? And um, had the opportunity. And I think part of what made the sales letter so good is like, so Jed, incredible copywriter, hates marketing gurus. <laughs> you know, like at least he did. You know, I'm oh, still pretty sure that hasn't. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I, I, loved marketing gurus, right? Like I, I studied all of them. Like I'm here riffing on who wrote what and what book. Right. Um, and so I'd studied all these people. I knew who all these people were. And so I was able to like infuse my own excitement for all these people being in the room together with Brian's stories and like having studied boardroom because I wanted them as a client, but I also knew they hired all the best copywriters and stuff. And so it translated into Paris and Propolis ended up saying like, he, he was like, Brian, I didn't realize you'd learn to be a copywriter and write so well, like, because I captured my own excitement that paralleled Brian's excitement. Um, Yeah. So I think that kind of answered your question about how it all came together and hopefully provided some suggestions for. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And that event sold out pretty quickly. Uh, So you got a lot of, and Brian kept giving you credit, which was great, but 
you've kind of leveraged that in, I've seen you use it in so much of your marketing material for other things. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, when you have that feather in your cap, you, you have to wave it around from time to time. Right. Um, if that was the year that I, you know, I ended up, I ended up launching, doing my first copywriter coaching and like Chris, Wright, Hell, when you're at money, when you're at money map, um, I don't, I don't know how many, like percentage wise of the people who I ended up doing some level of coaching or junior copywriting with, it's like 80% of them went on to get jobs at money map with you guys. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that like I should have been the money map training school. Um, I should have formalized that. It's because you know me so well, and Jed. <laughs> you're yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. The style of work for them. <laughs> um, but like in 2014, Chris Wright, like he ended up, uh, being one of my first coaching clients. Um, and in part, I'm sure it was because of, of Titans. I ended up, um, just finding it easier to promote myself because, Hey, I was the Titans copywriter. And so now I can align myself with Dan Kennedy and, uh, Gary Bensvinga, Jay Abraham, like all those people. Um, I've been to private events that Jay Abraham was involved with that, I still remember almost getting kicked out of a room. Like he's not supposed to be here, but because I was the Titans copywriter, uh, Jay's daughter, Michelle just went to bat for me. And it's like, no, he's going to be in this room. Um, it was, you know, it was uh, whatever. Like I was qualified to be in that room. Um, but it was, it, it, it was kind of a funny scenario that, you know, it's, it's, it's a ticket. It's, it's a ticket in the door. Um, whether that's a ticket in the door to somebody's consciousness because it's a really solid proof point is like, I know copywriting or it's a ticket in the door through some other, you know, some other whatever, right. Uh, getting in that room with Jay Abraham. So one of the things I like to ask a lot of copywriters about uh, you've heard Scott Adams concept of the skill stack. I'm, where, not, I'm not sure. Explain so it. So Scott Adams wrote the Dilbert comic. And he said, yeah. I'm, I'm a pretty good uh, illustrator, but I'm not the best. I'm kind of funny, but I'm not hilarious. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm pretty good at business, but not the best. But when you put all of these three skills together, I have a wildly successful, you know, yeah. comic strip. So okay. I, always, I always look at copywriters because it's not just the writing. It, when you have to yeah. have a successful career, there's so many other things that come with it. So if you had to kind of name your skill stack, your top two or three skills, can you can you think of anything of so obviously writing is going to be one of them, but anything yeah. else that you, like is it networking? Because that seems like a lot of what you're describing is getting in the room with the right people at the right time. Maybe that's that's part of it. I still remember like uh, at Titans it went to this VIP dinner. I'm not sure if you were there. Maybe um, no, I wasn't. I was okay. with the Money Map crew at that point. Yeah. So he hosted this VIP dinner. And one of the things that they did, it was modeled on these boardroom dinners, which were these really cool things, um, is went around the table and Brian actually introduced every single person. And it was much bigger than their normal dinner. So he was there. It was like 60 people, him going around the, the room, introducing everybody. And you answered questions beforehand. And he, he talked about, um, it, 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 like he asked you to share your superpower and um, this fits in my, in my skill stack that there's the copywriting, right? But, but I said that I help create marketing campaigns that are greater than the sum of their parts where I'm always thinking, not just like, what is the sales letter going to say, but a word I use a lot now or, or phrase term I use a lot now is conversion architecture. So understanding funnels and having multiple upsells and having follow-up sequences or when webinar campaigns were fairly new. I, I did, I created something for Casey Research that ended up being the model that they were using even after they sold to Stansbury um, that admittedly wasn't original, but I brought it to Casey Research where it was um, like the the event premiere. And so they did a big studio recording and we 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 did it like a launch where it was this event and there was a whole uh, sequence designed to get people to sign up for it and a whole sequence to, designed to get people to attend live and then a whole sequence designed to get people to uh, do the replay and all of that. So it's it's all of this like conversion architecture stuff that for me is beyond copywriting. Like it's, it's, it's in the skill stack. Um, those are the two main ones for 
marketing results. But then I do think that you're right, that I have this natural pull towards building relationships. And admittedly, in the last few years, probably a combination of COVID and other things, like I haven't been in person nearly as much as I probably should have been. And I'm feeling a pull back towards doing more in-person stuff. Being in Nebraska, it's hard, like it's hard to do a lot of in-person stuff versus being in, let's say the East coast, uh, area, um, a couple hundred miles of New York city and you have a lot of in-person opportunities. Um, yeah. So networking and definitely long-term building relationships has been important to me. I'm trying to think of like other major things in this skill set. I do have kind of the simplification mindset that I, I like to take concepts and simplify them. And I think that that's been really helpful in, for example, working with junior copywriters and developing junior copywriters when I've done that. I'm actually moving back into um, like being brought in as an outside copy chief into an agency right now. Um, so there is some level, that's, that's something that, um, that I've recognized as a, is a real strength of mine is, is not just writing copy, but like all that thinking behind copy mm -hmm. and, and research and all of that. And, and the copy chief role when done in an active way, um, can, can, can really uh, support that. So like, and you know, when, for example, working with a junior writer, which is something I learned through working with you guys at Money Map, it's like, you know, Jed could spend an hour or two on the phone with us and like define an entire promo <laughs> and then, and then step away. And I've, I've realized that that is my most valuable time on any project versus the long, hard slog of writing every line of the promo. Um, yeah, Jed's, know, that, yeah, Jed's interesting to watch work because you'll sit back, you'll bring him a, your first draft of your promo, and you'll have talked about the idea and stuff a little bit. You know, I, I just Jed Canty is, uh, he wrote the Aftershock promo, which was one of the first $100 million promos in our space. He sold well over a billion dollars worth of stuff. He's the top copywriter at Money Map Press. Uh, he built Newsmax Money News up from $10 million to $100 million. So he's just one of the all-time greats in copy working today. Yeah. And he has this really annoying way of reading your copy and then just dictating something to you that's 10 times better than what you wrote. <laughs> and you have to type fast or record them, but you're never going to get it all. But he, yeah. he speaks in copy when he wants to. It's just, a, it's a superpower. It's amazing to watch. Um, yeah. 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 It's interesting, guys. I've taken, you're a little more of an extrovert than I am, I think. Like I'm fairly introverted. My strategy yeah. has been to attach myself to someone successful and kind of uh, <laughs> not ride their coattails, but absorb everything I can with them. Like that's what I did with Mark Ford. When I got in there, you know, I wouldn't leave him alone. I was getting, you know, copy reviews every time I could. He ended up introducing me to Jed Canty. Uh, Jed, you know, I've, I've been with him since 2011. Uh, originally at Newsmax where I wrote a promo with Steve Bannon at the time, <laughs> Generation Zero. So that was a interesting experience before he became the infamous Steve Bannon. Yes. Um, but I really didn't start having good success until I got to Money Map. Uh, and it just took a couple of years to really learn financial copy. But yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, Marcella Allison, who you mentioned earlier, has been a great contact for me because she's such an extrovert and she knows everybody yeah. and she loves to help other people. So she's made a lot of really um, lucrative, honestly, introductions to me. Marcella so is a massive, massive connector. I, like, I'm, I don't want to tell people to go try and get into her good graces, but if you do end up in her good graces, because I don't want to overwhelm her with that, but if you do end up in her good graces, you just end up, whether you want it or not, getting a thousand great introductions. Yeah. Marcella is dropping off the grid for the next two months, so don't try <laughs> for a little good. while to contact good. her. Um, um, yeah, it, it's weird that you describe me as an extrovert because I definitely don't consider myself an extrovert, but, um, like I found that I've developed the skills enough that I kind of ride the line where I don't, and, and I've even taken like the Myers-Briggs test that tell you extrovert, introvert, and they find that I ride the line. I'm like in the middle. Right. Um, so I can do extrovert. I can do introvert. I am most comfortable. Like if, if you go back to the, the definition of, do you get recharged by being alone or being with people? 
right? I, I get recharged by being alone, um, which by that definition, I'm an introvert. Um, but there's a, there's a, another spectrum to that where it's, uh, how exhausting do you find it to be around other people? That's true. And I probably don't find it as exhausting as many people who consider themselves to be introverts. Yeah. I go to a conference. You're not going to hear from me for three days afterwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's me and my dog. <laughs> We're not talking to people. Yeah. But even then, like in a, in a situation like this, I, I love the one-on-ones because, you know, even if I feel like an introvert, a situation like this, it's really easy to, to end up just coming out and, and actually one-on-one conversations get me more energized than being alone. Um, yeah. So where do we, where do we want to go? Where do we want to, uh, wrap up? I, um, well, I, so you're, you've done something that I'm kind of in the process of doing right about three months ago. Now, two months ago, I basically dropped all my copywriting clients. Now I'm still talking mm -hmm. to them and, you know, I have a relationship, but I'm, uh, you know, I started this podcast. I'm going to start a membership site soon. So, and you've kind of gone that route already. So I kind of just want to, while I have you on a podcast, <laughs> tap your knowledge. So what, what, what inspired you to start the breakthrough marketing secrets and kind of what has that process been like? What has that experience been like going from pure copywriter to kind of coach and business owner? Yeah. Uh, I feel like part of it, um, part of it has been like a, a labor of love, a labor of um, passion. Like I feel like I've always, there, there's something to that, that line from Hamilton. Why do you write? Like you're running out of time where I've always been pulled to write. And so like when I wrote articles for AWI, it was just so easy for me to write in my own voice. Uh, when I have written articles for other people, it's easier for me to write in my own voice and to share my own perspective than it is for me to write client stuff, even though I've gotten pretty good at writing client stuff. Um, and I just, it started without, a, a revenue model and it started without a um, real goal. It just started as I'm going to start writing an, an email every day. And I remember I actually just asked some copywriter who I, I don't rem remember her name at this point, but I, I, it was like, I'm going to start writing a daily email and we're talking. So can you join my email list and start reading them? <laughs> <laughs> um, and she said, yeah. And so I just started publishing this daily email and um, then started kind of creating opportunities out of that. A lot of it was like, hey, I've done copy reviews for clients, so uh, I'll offer a copy review service. Hey, I might do coaching. Um, so I'll do this coaching service. Then I started doing training and then I went from training to wanting to create this, this resource that I sometimes call like Netflix for copywriting and marketing training. So it's just you sign up for, you know, one monthly fee and you get access to the entire catalog. Uh, you know, that, that comes, a lot of the decisions that I've made have come with their own challenges. Like, I feel like I'm never good enough in terms of volume of content creation. I feel like I over obligate myself to some of those things. I've never talked about that on a podcast before. Um, and Sometimes that can be a little bit difficult, especially because one of the things that I've prioritized in going into copywriting is um, freedom of time and freedom of place, but freedom of time and specifically the time to be able to pick my kids up from school a lot of days of the week. And in the summertime, I'm down to like half time uh, in terms of my weekly schedule. And so the rhythm that I get in during the school year cannot be maintained through the summer, which can be a challenge at the beginning of most summers. Um, yeah. Um, so the process was kind of a, kind of an organic one, but one of the things that worked really well for me was, um, I think that a lot of people end up getting burnt out on financial copy after a period of time. Everybody. Um, and, and there's, there's ways to deal with it and ways to respond to that. But what I noticed was like every new project, I was kind of dreading it more than anything, so when it came time to just step back and say, uh, can I have something else that sustains me for a while? Uh, Breakthrough Marketing Secrets, BTMS Insiders, the membership site, um, all of that became 
uh, the sustenance, right? Like one of the things that I learned in that, in that dip, the value of despair during my early freelancing, my, my accountant, um, sat down with me and he said, Roy, you need, you need two approaches to income. So what was going on was I was like, everything was an attempt to get rich, right? Like everything, every project was an attempt to get rich. And I, that's why I became hyper-focused on individual projects. And he said, that's great. That's fine but you need to pay your bills income. And so on a monthly basis, you need to be bringing in income that is specifically, that's going to cover all your bills. And then you can pursue the get rich stuff and spend as much time as you need on that. Right. And so what it allowed me to do was kind of create this income stream that, you know, more than covered my bills and, um, and any kind of short-term financial thing that I would be concerned about. And then, um, pursue the things that I was more excited about for the long term that didn't have to pay off immediately. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it has always been more about freedom than anything else, I would say. Um, but in some ways, I, I, I've fallen into the entrepreneurial curse where in the pursuit of freedom, we launch a business that ends up um, sometimes feeling like less freedom. Yeah, uh, I, I can understand yeah. that. Do you ever consider scaling back the content if that's your, you know, you're putting out a video five days a week, basically, and a short article that goes along with it and, and then all the training content that you're building. So have yeah. you considered like bringing that back or do you think it would affect the business too much? I, I do consider it. It might improve the business. It might reduce the business. I tend to uh, try to make sure that I fulfill any past obligations, but it's weird to set up this like perpetual ongoing obligation <laughs> because when are you going to stop fulfilling that? Right. Um, I, yes, I've considered it. Uh, and I have continuously decided not to yet. Um, I certainly could scale back. I could make decisions, um, that would be consistent with that. Uh, yeah. Um, it is there. There is a little bit of a balancing act between deciding to scale back and um, and making sure that I'm fulfilling any promises that I've made. Um, yeah, so I'll just I'll just say yes, I've considered it. Um, yeah, but it's here I am reasons, five days a week. Yeah, one of the reasons I started with a one day a week podcast as like when I originally planned this out, I was going to do three day a week. You know that yeah. that consistently showing up in front of people, but I wanted to make sure that. I wasn't going to overwhelm myself <laughs> yeah. as I, you know, yeah. first of all, I was burnt out on financial copywriting, putting out, you know, a bunch of promos a year and <laughs> trying to keep up with all the launches and stuff. And I had two copywriters under me. So it was just a lot of work. Um, so yeah. I wanted, yeah. I wanted to scale it back, but I, I'm considering ramping up to two. I'm just, I don't want to get myself in that trap <laughs> of like, how am I going to get this content out this week? Yeah. It can be difficult. And, and I actually work with a publishing, I work with an assistant, a publishing assistant who um, does a lot of the publishing stuff behind the scenes with me. Um, and, and that was good because it allowed me to maintain the current volume of content after like a, a learning period, because anytime you're working with somebody new, there's a learning period. Um, but it allowed me to maintain the, the volume of content while reducing the workload. Um, you know, ultimately it's about like my, my highest value activities are the content creation and marketing creation in my business. Uh, and so it's about focusing as much as possible on, on that stuff. Yeah. And if I'm getting burnt out at this point, I'm, I am better able to recognize it. And there's also been a lot of like personal growth in terms of understanding like what work actually looks like um, that we haven't gotten into and probably don't have time for here. Um, but, um, yeah, like it's, it, it, it is something that whenever you're launching a business, you, you kind of have to commit. I don't necessarily think that you have to commit to like 70 hours a week, driving yourself completely bonkers. I don't, some people do believe that, um, and maybe in some industries that's more needed than in others, but, um, in the pursuit of, you know, getting out of the machine, I want to build a business that I can build within the, the time constraints that I give to it. Uh, and, and right now that's, that's what this has been. Um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most of the uh, businesses I'm consulting with right now, just on a part-time basis are uh, like tech startups 
or yeah. one, one pharmaceutical startup, one marketing startup. And those dudes, you do have to work 70 hours a week when you're launching a business that has employees and you're trying to do, you know, capital raises and all that. Uh, but I'm sitting back going, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to build a machine that's worse than one I was trying to escape from. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. I think that's probably a pretty good uh, phrase to wrap it up on. Yeah, man. That works for you. So for my audience, can you tell people where they can find you? Okay. So probably the, the primary link, actually, l- let me do this uh, since we have a little bit of time between recording and publishing to, to get it out. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to set up a link at breakthroughmarketingsecrets.com slash Henry for Henry Bingaman, right? Uh, breakthroughmarketingsecrets.com slash Henry for uh, people who have listened to this episode. That will link you through to just the most relevant uh, ways to connect with me uh, relative to what we have, what we've talked about here. And, uh, and, and yeah, you, you'll be able to sign up, at least follow my daily episodes, uh, get email updates, et cetera. And uh, for my audience, what's the best way to follow you? Yeah, uh, I'm actually going to rip you off there. So I'm going to set up a link at uh, henryb.co slash Roy. Um, I think I'm going to have a special bonus there. Uh, there's a, a marketing or a sales letter breakdown that I think people might find interesting. Yeah. Um, so we'll give that away for free. Um, Henry and- Henry has made a small fortune in sales with his copy. I don't know the exact number, um, but yeah, I've, he's I've done well over three hundred million. I you know I got my income yeah. up to one point four million a year at the peak. Um, and one of my favorite ways as a copywriter to learn is to actually have copywriters say, "I wrote this for this reason," right? And that's like one way that I've taught copywriting is I wrote this for this reason. Like let's go through line by line. And so a sales letter breakdown from Henry. Um, Yeah, good stuff. (laughs) Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.